Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Bible contains remarkable stories of miracles and divine interventions. Moses parted the sea. Peter healed a man lame from his mother's womb. Jesus drove demons out of people and raised others from the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? We too have a beam of divine light and guidance that God has put within the heart of every man. And it's one of the greatest proofs that there is a God. More amazing supernatural things are happening than we realize. This is Divine Intervention, the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. Divine Intervention was created and produced with the purpose of encouraging believers, spiritual seekers, and skeptics alike that Jesus is alive and is still performing miracles and working in the world today. I believe in miracles. Here's your host, Daniel Fazina. Hello, friend, and welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. Yes, that's right. You are listening to the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. And I am your host, Daniel Fazina. Once again, so excited and honored, privileged to be with you today. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to join me. And I hope today's guest is really going to inspire you. In fact, I really believe he will. Got an amazing story of... um, suffering horrifically and then God really doing a miracle and bringing him through that and using all the suffering to God's glory. So we'll get to our special guest in a moment. But before we do, I'd like to remind you that uh, you can always find Divine Intervention Radio online. If you miss any of the episodes, uh, we're at divineinterventionradio.com. And we're also on YouTube, Divine Intervention Radio. You can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Divine Intervention Radio. And, of course, you can follow me on Twitter, Daniel Fazina one on twitter.com. That's twitter.com slash Daniel Fazina the numeral one. And if this show has encouraged you in any way, uh, if it's affected your life or your relationship with the Lord, if it means something to you, I would love to hear about it. You can email me and drop me a line at divineintervention at mail.com, divineintervention at mail.com. Also, friend, I have a request. I need a favor from you. If you're listening to this broadcast between October 28th and November 24th, 2015, I need a huge favor from you. I've entered my young daughter, Evangeline, into the Gerber Baby 2015 photo search competition. They're looking for a spokesbaby for 2016. So I submitted a photograph of my 11-month-old daughter, Evangeline. The judges are going to pick the grand prize winner. But there are milestone awards for, you know, toddler and sitter and birth, crawler, that kind of thing. And those are determined by popular vote. So I'm requesting your help in overwhelming Gerber servers with the love of the cuteness. (laughs) So if you wouldn't mind, please go to Gerber.com. Click on the Gerber Baby 2015 photo search button there. And uh, you can register your email and then you can vote for my Evangeline Hope. That would be so awesome. I would really appreciate your help. She's baby number 286048. Once again, 286048. Her name is Evangeline. And you can do a search there. And then uh, share the cuteness. You can share it to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and you know get your friends to vote for her too. I would really appreciate that. Again, the contest is from October 28th to November 24th, 2015. So if you're listening to this broadcast within that time frame, please go to Gerber.com, register, and vote for Evangeline, baby number 286048 from Henrico, Virginia. That's 286048. And you can see the parent's name there is Daniel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your help with this. Now I want to get to our special guest. I want you to picture with me that you are a teenager and you're sitting in a car at a stoplight minding your own business when all of a sudden you get slammed from behind by another vehicle and you break your back. And it's so severe that you are in pain, agonizing pain every single day for years. You know, when you go into the hospital, they ask you what your pain level is based on a 1 to 10 scale. Zero being no pain, one is very minimal pain, and ten being off the charts pain. Can you imagine living with a ten or higher pain level every single day for years and what that would do to a young person? 
Well, today's guest is that such young person. His name is Pete O'Shea. He's a Christian talk show host and a Christian comedian and a motivational speaker. And he suffered with that same debilitating pain from a horrific back injury for 17 years until God gave him a miracle. Now he's going back for the rest of you who suffer mind-numbing, kill-me-now pain on a daily basis. And friend, you are going to be really encouraged by his story. And it's my pleasure to welcome Pete O'Shea right now on Divine Intervention Radio. Pete, welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. It's so great to have you. It's awesome to be here, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. Not a problem. I was very excited to hear your story when our mutual friend Bruce told me about you. And I uh, had an opportunity to read your book, Pain Was My Friend. And I have to tell you, it is uh, laugh out loud funny and tragic all at the same time. And it's amazing what God has done in your life. And we definitely want to get to your miracle story. But before we do that, let's take it to the beginning a little bit. Tell us about your background growing up and what it was like for you. Yeah, I was born in Rockaway Beach, New York. Uh, I was the first of four children for New York City firemen. Nice. And his uh, lovely wife, uh, my mom, Elaine, uh, they raised us in the faith. They raised us well. They worked real hard. They gave us everything they could possibly give us and more. It was a very good childhood. Uh, grew up uh, wanting to be a sportscaster all my life. That's what I wanted. I went to St. John's University and studied that. You're kidding me. Oh, my gosh. I went to St. John's University, too. Is that right? In Jamaica, I Queens, yeah. games on the radio station. <laughs> uh, I was there with Mark Jackson and... Uh, uh, Chris Mullen and wow. all those guys were there, and Frank Viola and John Franco were on the baseball team, and it was such an exciting time. And I thought for sure I'd get out of school and I'd be a, a color commentator for basketball and baseball. Those were the uh, glory I days. I didn't see it that way. I didn't see it that way. Uh, well, first of all, I couldn't dunk a basketball. I could dunk a cookie really good, then. <laughs> I couldn't dunk a basketball. <laughs> so they only wanted guys who used to play the game. That's all they were giving that job to. So uh, it didn't quite work out that way. I got a job at a newspaper and a part-time job at a radio station when I got out of school, and everything seemed okay. But uh, I was bored. I didn't enjoy it. That wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. And so I called my father up one day, and I told him I was going to quit my job and go be a stand-up comedian. And I pulled the phone real far back because I thought he was just going to scream his head off. <laughs> me. You know, I just put through college, you're going to do this to me. It was exactly what I thought was going to happen, but he turned it on me. He didn't go that way. Here's what he said to me. He goes, you know what? You've had a lot of crazy, lunatic, dumb ideas in your life, but that ain't one of them. Everybody knows you're funny. I got your back. How do I help? What do we got to do? Wow. That's pretty cool. And he supported it. Yeah, 100%. He gave me some money to live off of for a while. They all got behind it, my whole family. They actually endorsed it big time. I I don't make it into that without them. And I got to be a stand-up comedian because of them. So, and all that was going on, even while everything happened with the car accident and, and all that. That was all in the midst of all that. So, And you're speaking, uh, you know, you mentioned the car accident. That plays a major role in your testimony. And you detail it in your book, Pain Was My Friend, which is a really enjoyable read. But some of the things you went through, it's just hard to believe that you went through all of that. And yet, you're still here to tell the story. So, uh, I know it. tell us what happened that day. Sure. Yeah, that also shows you the miracle of God, because I should be dead several times over. Uh, and there's no doubt I'm still alive today because I have a divine destiny. God has still has a plan for me. So it all starts back on March the 8th, uh, 1984. And I am working for Jamaica Savings Bank as a check picker-upper, or bagger, as they called it. Uh, back then, before we had anything digital, you had to go around to all the branches and pick up that day's canceled checks and bring them back to the main branch. And that was my job. And I was sitting still the light one day, and I, Daniel, I'll be honest with you, it was the one and only time I was minding my own business. <laughs> but nothing wrong, okay? It was the only day I could tell you I didn't do it, okay? <laughs> I was just sitting there, and a guy in a Ford Bronco who wasn't paying attention and was driving way too fast hit me real hard, uh, real, real hard. And the uh, next thing I know, I'm in the emergency room, and I got one of those cones on my head, and there's a lot of people talking about me, and I can't see, and they're saying all this stuff, and they're whispering, and I don't know what's going on. And then a little Indian doctor comes over to me, and I'll never forget this. Uh, if I still need to muster anger for some reason, if I need to, maybe I'm going to act in something, and I, want, <laughs> I remember this moment, because he was so uh, incredulously cold about it. He walked up to me, and he said, uh, Mr. O'Shea, do you have a back problem? And I said, no. And he said, you do now. You're going to be staying with us for quite some time. Oh, boy. I was like, wow. Well, talk about your lack of bedside manner. Uh, and then a, uh, a surgeon came in to see me, and he told me I had a spondylolisthesis. 
I know you want to say God bless you after I said that, right? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like I'm sneezing. Uh, but it actually means that the L4 vertebrae had pushed forward and come all the way to the side. And I was slamming down the whole vertebrae on the nerve exiting from L5. And the doctor comes in, this very arrogant surgeon. And I remember he looked like Tom Siebel, who's one of my boyhood idols. So for a moment, I liked him, but then he opened his mouth, and that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in a very declarative voice, in a very snotty way, very, very arrogant, I'm going to operate on you. I'm going to take you upstairs right now. We're going to try to fix this. And he said, I'm going to put two foot wide incisions on both sides of your body. And he says, then I'm going to put a, I'm going to take bones. I'm going to shave them off your hip. I'm going to like matchsticks. I'm going to stick them in there. And then I'm going to put a cage around it with screws and plates and a big giant thing. I said, wait a second. You're not doing that to me. He said, yeah, yeah, we're going to go upstairs and we're going to do it right now. And I said, what's the chances that's going to work? He said, 50-50. I said, you are out of your cotton pick in mind. There's no chance that you're doing that to me for a 50-50 chance. Hmm. No way. Not very no good odds. You know, and he kept pushing it and pushing it. And I called him a barbaric narcissist, and I hit him in the head with a bedpan. And I finally got him out of the room. <laughs> but he came back later on, okay? He came back. He still kept pushing it, okay? And he said to me, if you don't do this surgery... By the time you're in your 30s, your whole body is going to fall apart. Your left side won't function at all. That leg won't work. You won't feel anything. You'll be in mind-numbing, kill-me-now pain 24 hours a day. You won't be able to breathe. You won't be able to eat. You won't be able to function. You won't even be able to go to the bathroom. I said, you know what? That still sounds better than the cockamamie idea you came in here with, so I'll take that. Yeah. And he said, you're crazy. I said, well, that's a given. Everybody knows I'm crazy, but I don't believe in you and what you're offering. This sounds crazy to me. And so I'm not going to do it. Hmm. And so I didn't do it. I didn't do the surgery. And I, and I stayed for in the hospital, and then I went home, and they said to me, he said to me, he came back another day, he said, I could collapse your spine with my thumb. And I suggest you go on Social Security and don't ever leave your house. If you have to leave your house, wrap yourself in bubble wrap. Oh, my gosh. And, and don't go out because you're a walking time bomb. That is crazy. And, you know, he was obviously trying to frighten me into the surgery, but that wasn't working. You know, I wasn't going for it. Now, in the days that I was in the hospital, it was brutal for me emotionally and spiritually. I was really angry at God. I was blaming him. And I was screaming, yelling, and throwing stuff all over the room. If you can, again, in the book I say, if you can imagine what uh, uh, Lieutenant Dan was like in Forrest Gump when he first lost his legs, and he's foaming at the mouth and screaming and flinging stuff, that was me. Four roommates in the first five days because they were trying to get out of there as fast as they could. Wow. Uh, because it really, it, you know, a 19-year-old boy gets told this, that his life is over, basically, that, that he can't function, that he's a walking time bomb, that he has this gigantic broken spine. Mm. And I said, well, no, no, but I knew in my heart of hearts that it was wrong to go for that surgery. And I had seen other people get it, and Daniel, they look worse afterwards, and they just became professional patients needing surgery every year or two. I said, no, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, I remember reading about that in your book and, you know, how you went in and saw all these patients that were in really, really bad shape. So, you know, what did you end up doing? Well, I really did nothing is what I did, okay? okay? I mean, I kept going to see that doctor every once in a while to get medication, and he kept trying to talk me into the surgery, and I kept saying no, and we kind of had this love-hate, well, mostly dislike relationship because he was pushing and I was pushing back, and, I, and you know, I just didn't believe in it. So I did nothing. I, I did the best I could to live life. I... Yeah. self-medicated uh, obviously that's part of the book also drugs and alcohol took their role in the scenario pain became my friend and he became the source of my existence and everything revolved around if i wanted to go to the bank and the cleaners in the same day i had to take the pills at the right time and get a nap in afterwards and ice down to do any of those kinds of things and you know, each year I saw functionality get harder and harder. While, again, I'm still being a stand-up comic. I'm still making people laugh when, ironically, Daniel, I found absolutely nothing funny. You know, yeah. and life was falling apart for me every way that it could. That's, uh... And it just managed as best I could. I just lived through it as mm. best I could. You know, in your book, Pain Was My Friend, you, you describe really a, a downward spiral of um, just you know, drugs and alcohol and mind-numbing pain. And, and the things you describe in there is just so hard to believe that you could even function uh, and it survive. It is hard to believe that I was able to function and, and that, I was, that I'm still alive. Yeah. And that even putting all those things in the book was difficult to go back and relive and to think about what mm. I had done to myself and to others and how far I had plummeted down, right. how much of a toll the enemy and the pain had had on me. It was 
very embarrassing. I was really afraid I was going to get grounded, too. I thought when my parents read this, I was going to not be allowed out for two weeks, you know, no TV for two weeks, probably. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I just, through God's grace, kept being able to function when I really shouldn't have been able to. And I began to alienate everybody around me. I was getting in beefs with everybody because I was so angry and so bitter. Mm. And again, so much drugs and alcohol that I wasn't able to function. I I couldn't think clearly. I didn't know what was going on in my own life. It was a revolving spiral downward. And I just barely was existing. I wasn't alive. Mm. You know, I was just barely existing, and it was hell on earth. Now, tell us exactly what the extent of your injuries and your symptoms were so we can understand, you know, why you had to self-medicate. I mean, you know, people ask you when you go into hospitals, they describe your pain level on a 1 to 10 scale, 1 being hardly any pain and 10 being suicidal, like, you know, kill me now kind of pain. Um, Describe what you had. Uh, Mine was probably into the 20s, I would say. Oh, my gosh. Making that scale. Uh, pounding, pounding, pounding all day long, both in the area there, the lower spine, and across the left hip. My left hip had its own heartbeat, boom, 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 pounding all the time. Uh, I was always in muscle spasm. It was always in muscle spasm all throughout my spine. Uh, The left leg, the left side, and specifically with that nerve, again, the L4 vertebrae was now slamming down on the nerve coming from L5, which goes down your hip and down the back of your leg. Wow. So no impulse is going down my leg, so the muscles are all beginning to atrophy. The feeling is gone. I have no sensation in the in, in the leg. Uh, I can't feel anything. I can't. Uh, you could jump up and down on my foot, and I didn't feel it. You could uh, literally poke me with stuff, and I didn't feel it. And again, everything the doc said was beginning to come true. At the beginning, he said, "You know, you won't be able to go to the bathroom." I couldn't. I couldn't uh, do it. I couldn't do the process of it. I couldn't get out of a chair. I couldn't cut my own meat or tie my own shoe. And it was just a constant pain, pain, pain. Uh, right there where you would put your belt, right there the belt line across there was just absolute brutal day-to-day wow. agony. And you lived uh, like this in pain. You woke for... up with, you went to sleep with. And you were how old when the accident happened? Nineteen. Nineteen, and you lived like this until you were in your 30s? I was about 36 when it was finally come to the point of the, the breaking point occurred. Yeah, so wow. it was about 17 years. That is insane. I mean, I, I had back pain, too. Uh, from a cartilage ring that was torn and a bulging disc pushing out on against a nerve. Um, so I can relate to it, but mine was not severe. It was mild to moderate pain, but it was just always there, you know, and I lived with that for 10 years, and I, you know, even the moderate and mild stuff was very annoying. So I can't even imagine, you know, what you went through uh, and, of course, you know, having to self-medicate. Now, during this time... What was your spiritual life like? Were, were you oh, seeking answers? It was like I had thrown my spirit away. I, I say in the book that it was like I just tossed it into a, a trash heap, and I was two-dimensional. Okay. And I, and I no longer had a relationship with God. I had no understanding anymore, even though he was there the whole time. And again, looking back on it now, he was saving me. He was holding me up. And he was propping me up the whole time. But at that point, I was so angry and so bitter, and I couldn't understand why. Why mm. was this happening to me? I, you know, I didn't do anything wrong, and I, and I just I wanted to be happy. I wanted to be well adjusted. I wanted to know what like a normal life was like. I never had one. My entire adult life was about mitigating, dealing with, walking around pain. There were days, there were times where for weeks at a time I couldn't get out of bed. Wow. There were times where life just passed me by. Events that I couldn't go to, things I couldn't be part of. Forget about doing anything like play golf or have some fun with friends. Anything that involved any kind of physical activity, I'm out. I can't go. Wow. And so it just kept piling on. And, and the, 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 the spiritual and emotional trauma was even deeper than the physical was. And, and I felt like God had abandoned me. Mm. You know, And mm. I felt like I was lost, that I was finished, that I was in hell. I thought I was already in hell. And you just don't feel like there's any hope. You don't feel like there's any way out. And that you're done. You just literally feel like death is the best thing that can happen to you. And I many times ask people, could you just take this pillow and stick it over my head, please, and just get me out of this agony? I can't take any more of it. Wow. That's amazing. And yet, I think one of the ironic things is that here you are being a stand-up comedian, making other people laugh. And, you know, I've heard this about comedians that they use, you know, their comedy to mask their own pain. Um, is that kind of like what you were doing? I mean, how did oh, you... Oh, most definitely. Okay. I used it not only to mask it, but I used it to fuel the pain. Like, the pain fueled the comedy, the comedy fueled the pain. I, I, 
I, I, I was like in this point, Daniel, where I had to force myself to get up there on that stage. And I, and I would sometimes have to use a stool because I couldn't walk around. Mm. And I would not limp so that nobody could see it and get through the show and get in the second show. Oh, boy, goodness, now I'm stiff, now I'm sore. And so it was really hard. So I channeled everything into it. I would use that pain as my motivation. And I would get, like, you know, grinding teeth and say, yeah, you want to see? You think you can beat me, pain? I'll beat you. (laughs) I'll show you that I can still be funny. And again, I found nothing humorous at that point, which is totally ironic. But I was able to function well enough. And again, I think if I'd had a normal job, an eight-hour job, I never would have been able to do it. But comedy is sort of a you know, a couple hours job. I mean, although there's lots of travel involved and such, but I would pick guys to go with me on the road who I knew could help me, could help be my nurse, right. take care of me, knew the ice routine, knew the how I had to get through it and, and would be able to help me and carry stuff for me and be there for me. And you just say, okay, I'm not going to get beat. The doc's voice kept bringing in my head, and you're going to be nothing. You're going to be stuck at home for the rest of your life. You'll have no mm. life. Wow. I was bound and determined to prove him wrong. Wow. And I didn't care how much it hurt. Wow. I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to give up. Well, I'm it glad you didn't. It was really, really hard, buddy. It was, it was intense at times. I can't even imagine. I mean, like I said, I, I live with you know, chronic pain. For It was mild to moderate, though. So living with 10 out of 10 or 20 out of 10 pain level every single day for mm-hmm. 17 years, I mean, that's just, wow, um, what what that would do to a person. And you describe it very well and very graphically in your book, which I have to say, it's a sad read in one sense, but it's also laugh out loud funny in a lot of other places. I mean, you inject these metaphors and the, you know, I can see your comedic personality coming through in the way you describe situations and such. Again, the book is called Pain Was My Friend. We're visiting with uh, the author, Mr. Pete O'Shea, who is a talk show host himself and also a comedian. And you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina. Uh, Now, Pete, there's one incident in here, well, there were many, where God really spared you, but one that was particularly amazing and comical at the same time was your trip down to Panama when you were doing a a tour on a cruise line. Uh, Can you tell us about that wild adventure? That was pretty amazing. This is definitely God's hand that I'm still here to talk to you about this, without a doubt, okay? Because I should be, <laughs> I shouldn't have got out of that one, okay? That's, wow, okay? Uh, you know, again, because I wasn't able to really do the road anymore, my, a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you try the cruise ships? It's a couple of shows a month, and you make just the same kind of money, and hey, it's a lot easier. So, okay, so I said, that sounds good. I sent them my tape, they liked it, and they, they booked me. So I flew into uh, Panama. And now they were supposed to take me out to the ship by helicopter, but it was very windy and it was not going to work. So there was a guy standing there with a card with my picture on it and my name, and he said, I'm driving you to the ship. I said, okay. So uh, he had an ID. It seemed all good. And I, I don't really know where he fits into the equation in the end of it. I can never really figure out whether he was part of this or not. Okay. But anyways, we're driving along. And all of a sudden, it becomes a one-lane road, a dirt road. I mean, literally one lane, so you couldn't even pass. You, you know, some had to go one way for a while, then they stopped you, then the others went the other way. And there was a checkpoint there, and there were guys in uniform checking everybody's ID. And so when my turn came up, I showed him my uh, passport and my visa, my work visa, and he looked at it, and he said, uh, your work visa says you're going to be in the country one day. Does that make you a drug dealer? And I said, no, no, not at all. Uh-uh. He said, what are you? I said, I'm a comedian. He said, what's that? I said, you know, ha-ha, funny, I tell the jokes, you guys laugh, they pay me, you know, you don't know what that is. <laughs> I guess they don't have comedians in yeah. Uh, Panama. <laughs> yeah, he didn't uh, see the sarcasm at all. He wasn't enjoying my personality at all because he pulled me out of the car oh, boy. and started yelling at me pretty good and got a couple other guys over and they were yelling at me pretty good. And they I had an overnight envelope with all my paperwork in it and they dumped that into the street and I saw my IDs, I had a... Uh, jokes I wrote on the plane all blowing away my library card. So there's probably still somebody running library books on my library card down there in Panama now today, <laughs> all these years later. And somebody in a Panamanian comedy club running the jokes that I did that I had written down that I wrote on the plane. And so uh, and then they took my suitcase and they dumped that out, everything, my you know suit that I was wearing for the show, all that's now in the dirt. And then they're looking for, for, for drugs. And I said, I'm not a drug dealer, I'm a comedian. And so they uh, then marched me into the uh, banana field, and I got one guy's got a machine gun on my face. He's literally got the point of it stuck in my cheek. Oh my god! The other guy's got a butt of a machine gun in my back, 
and we're walking and walking and walking. I'm like, where are we going, you know? We get to this banana field, and they literally march me into the middle of it. Now, the banana field has the big stalk and everything across the top. So, dude, they got all the canopy they need now. Nobody can see anything. It's me and them out there in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, holy cow, I did all these open mic nights, and I did all this you know, stuff to finally get to this point, and I'm going to die in a banana field? I'm, I cannot believe this. <laughs> oh, you know? my gosh. <laughs> right? And so um, they um, they start yelling, and then they're, and then they're talking and back and forth, and they're smoking cigarettes, and they're blowing the smoke in my face, and they're really doing everything they can to be. This is like something out of a movie. It was out of a movie, for sure. And then I, I, two guys pull up in a green Jeep. And they identify themselves as U.S. custom agents, I think I heard them say. I couldn't really tell. I was far away. And when they walk out, and then those guys sort of relax now so I can turn and see what's going on. And uh, the one guy goes back to the car and gets an envelope and walks back out, and he hands them the envelope, which I, I can only assume at this point was there was money in it. Mm. And they said, okay, uh, let him go. So, okay, they bring me back to the car, and I meet those guys, and they say, okay, just go. It's going to be fine. Just go go do your show. It's going to be fine. Now, when I get to the ship, it's not fine. When I get there, those guys who had kidnapped me are standing there. Oh, my gosh. They got, I don't know how they got there before me, but they're standing there, and they're talking to the yeah, carnival has like a wannabe cop or whatever you would call them. You know, stay, I don't remember what they call them, but they're stewards or whatever they are, and they sort of check you in, and they do security and doing that kind of stuff. And they're talking to that fellow constable, I think they called him. And they're talking to him. And when I get there, they point at me and goes, yeah, that's the guy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the guy. Pete, said, hold that thought. we got to take a quick break. Again, friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio, and our special guest is Pete O'Shea. His book is Pain Was My Friend. You're listening to Divine Intervention with Daniel Fazina, and we'll return in just a moment. Times are tough, not getting easier, but there's an opportunity that could make a significant change in your financial situation. People are paying too much for home utilities, and everybody has them. Help friends and family save money and get paid for it. No obligation. You don't even have to talk to anyone unless you want to. Just listen to a three-minute recorded message. Call now, 715-GET-CASH. That's 715-GET-CASH. Listen, decide, and you could be on your way to a better tomorrow. 715-438-2274. That's 715-GET-CASH. Hi, this is Jay Jackson, lead singer for Apologetics, the Christian parody band, and you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio with our good friend Daniel Fazina. Welcome back to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and if you're just joining us, we have been speaking with our special guest, Pete O'Shea. He is a comedian a talk show host and an author. His book is called Pain Was My Friend. And before the break, we were talking about his pretty insane trip to Panama on a cruise line where he was booked to do stand-up comedy where he was almost shot and killed in a banana field of all places. Pete, welcome back. Hey, how are you, Dan? (laughs) Doing great. So we want to conclude this amazing story, how God pretty much intervened and uh, got you out of the situation. But you went back to the cruise line, and your kidnappers were there waiting for you. What happened next? Yeah, so then they turned to the guy, the constable who works for a carnival, and said, he's the guy. He's, he made it all up. He, he's trying to sue the cruise line. See, so he's trying to say we kidnapped him, but he made the whole thing up. He was being this and that to us, and we were just looking out for you guys and whatever. So he believes them, and he sticks handcuffs on me, and he's starting to walk me away. Oh, my gosh. Meanwhile, he don't ask me a single question, all right? So now, the same two guys who had got me out in the first place in the green Jeep show up again. Now, they must have been watching the whole thing because they were close by because they come charging in now like the cavalry. The one guy's actually standing up in the front seat. I heard a bugle, I think. I'm not sure, <laughs> but pretty sure I heard a bugle. Anyways, he comes up, and he says to the constable, no, 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 he's not lying. They did what they did. He's telling the truth. They're the ones that are lying, and they take the cuffs off me, and they put the cuffs on them, and they take them away. (laughs) So now I turn to the constable, and at this point I'm enraged, right? And I know, I said, you know, I look at him, I said, you were in on this. I said, how much did they pay you for my life? Mm. Please tell me my life was worth at least $100. You were working for them. Don't lie to me. You were working for them. And I'm screaming at him now right there at the gangplank to walk onto the ship. The entertainment director comes running down. He sees this going on. He grabs me. He goes, get on the ship. You're making a scene. Get on the ship. I get on the ship. I tell him the whole story. He don't believe an ounce of it. Hmm. He don't want to hear it. Go upstairs and get dressed for the show. Let's go. Enough. I don't want to hear it. All right, so we get up there. I go to do the show now. 
and again, I'm enraged at this point, and I'm, you know, worried, and I don't know what's going on. So instead of doing my act that night, I wound up telling the audience the whole story in full graphic detail. <laughs> Which is very entertaining and yeah. very oh, they, they, very well detailed. People were laughing. They thought it was the comedy. They thought it was the jokes. Well, I, I mean, I, got, I was laughing reading about it in your book only because it was so outlandish and unbelievable, but... Uh, obviously, it actually happened, but friend, you can read the whole unabridged story in "Pain Was My Friend" by Pete O'Shea. But uh, so you turn that into your comedy act, basically. That night, I did anyway. <laughs> it was a guy in the front row, and he's got a little baby with him, and it's a ten o'clock show, and the baby's crying because I'm screaming now, right? And and so I turned to that guy. I said, "Why did you bring an infant to a ten o'clock? Did you think I was going to do balloon animals for an hour and a half?" <laughs> Oh my gosh! You know, and, and so now they're coming at me. They're charging on the stage four or five of them at a time. The security guards they try to get me off the stage, and I'm banging them into each other and pushing them away. It looked like a Keystone Cop spit, is what it looked like. <laughs> again, people are cracking up. They think it's hilarious. They think it's the act. Okay, they actually believe it's my act. Okay, and oh, then they goodness. finally get four or five of them, and they grab me and they're pulling me off the stage now. And they get me right to the wings, and I push free again, and I lean in and I go, "Thanks, you guys have been great tonight." And they pull me <laughs> And you were able to do this with all your debilitating pain as well? Because anger. Oh, wow. Now fueling everything. I was Adrenaline, so huh? At the fact that I, again, had been in that, and I think fear, too, you know, because fear is easily turned into anger, and then I, and that becomes an explosive thing. Sure. Uh, but being stuck in that banana field, not knowing if I was going to live, and then that guy turning on me, you know, the, the Carnival Cruise Line guy turning on me, I was just so mad. It makes me wonder if maybe the uh, the two guys in the Jeep may have been angels, you know, I often wonder that, too, because they seemed almost like mythical in the way they were going about themselves. There was like an air about them that I couldn't really identify, and it seemed like things got different whenever they showed up. Like there was, the air even smelled differently whenever they showed up. And it was, I mean, twice they pulled me out, you know, right. or else I don't know what would have happened. I never saw either of them again. I couldn't even tell you really what they looked like, even though I spent time with both of them. All I can remember was the green Jeep and the guy standing as he was charging in, you know, from mm-hmm. Calvary. Well, it's obvious that God had more work for you to do, which is evidenced by the fact of your conversion, your healing, and what you're doing now, being a Christian radio host down in Florida, WTIS, uh, encouraging people there. And so I want to get to, you know, how you actually were healed with your back. And you had a pretty amazing visitation or vision from the Lord about this. Yeah. So take us to this story because you're in your mid 30s by this point. The pain is excruciating. You lost feeling in your leg, your left leg, your foot, and you were still looking for answers. You were still looking for a healing. And how did the Lord lead you to, you know, how you ultimately got healed? It was uh, now, so like you said, I'm 36, and it's at the worst of everything they said. I'm dragging the left leg behind me, and I'm in agony, and I can't function. So I, I can't really do the road anymore. I can't go out there and be funny and do the shows anymore. It's now impossible to do it. And so I'm done. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have any other job. I don't know what else I'm going to do. I got no hope. And so, desperation, I go back to the same doctor who I had been going to over the years, the surgeon who I met in the emergency room, who was, he and I, you know, had such a love-hate relationship and <laughs> pushing this ridiculous surgery. And so I get there to his place, and now my first harbinger that something wasn't going to go well was that I went into the waiting room. Dude, they had the same magazines in the waiting room, all right? 17 years later, <laughs> it was all over the magazine. It was the same People magazine. I'm not kidding you. I'm like, well, okay, this isn't good. <laughs> and I see him, and he was surprisingly nice to me for a guy who didn't like me, who I called a lot of names over the years, and he had done the same to me, and we fought over this. He cut me off on the medication. I'm going to force you on your knees to show up here and beg me for the surgery is what he told me once. Oh, my gosh. And so, uh, but he was nice. I guess you're nice when you're pushing $150,000 surgeries. You're sweet, right? So, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he offered the same exact surgery, two-foot-wide incisions, uh, got you open, put the screws and plates in you. Uh, and I said, okay, now what's the odds? He said 50-50. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You ain't hit the fairway on this surgery yet? What have you been doing for 17 years? Have you practiced on anybody since I left? <laughs> you were a model patient, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it was one of those <laughs> things. I tell you, buddy, the pain was in charge at that point. Sure. I mean, he had a lot to do with it. So anyways, I'm desperate. I, you know, and he's screaming at me, and he's telling me this is your only chance to shut up and do it. Just shut up and sign. You're going to do it. So I did. I signed up for the surgery, you know, and I went home and I knew that that wasn't right. I never believed in it then. I still didn't believe in it now. And on top of that, a guy who hates me, I'm going to let him have at me with a knife. <laughs> in no sense. Probably not a good idea. 
No. So that <laughs> night, I finally got to sleep about 3 a.m., and I had what you can't describe as a dream. It was a vision. Okay. okay? And, and I could tell you the difference. It was kind of like the difference between regular TV and HD TV. Gotcha. That's how much crisper it was, you know? And the sound was so much more powerful. Okay? And there I am in the operating room. And he's got the knife in his hand. He's got that, like, dastardly do-right look on his face, like he's going to come at me with it, like mm -hmm. excited he's going to finally get the chance to gut me. And I hear a voice. And the voice says, Peter, don't do it. Now, I knew right away that it was God, because only God and my mother call me Peter. Okay. Right? If you call me Peter, I'm not answering. My name is Pete. Peter sounds like a very bad... No, I can't do it. I'm Peter. <laughs> okay. Peter. I'm Pete. Okay. Pete, I'm or or the uh, you have many other nicknames like the Galvanizer. The Galvanizer. <laughs> uh, and Yeti. Yeti. Uh, Snowball. Uh, yeah. Snacks is another one of my. I got a lot. Of, I lead the National League in, in nicknames. But anyways, okay. I knew right then that it was God. You know, and you could just tell from the voice too. And he said, "Don't do it." There's a guy out there that does back surgery different. I taught him a new way, and I taught you how to speak. And I want you to go and you find this man. And you tell him he's going to do the surgery on you, and he's going to give you a job afterwards as his spokesperson. So together, you can go cure thousands of people. Hmm. And you tell this man that failure to assist you will lead to his eternal damnation. Bam, dream ends. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah, it is. Now, at this point in your life, had you been seeking after God? or At this point, I was at the point where, again, I was looking for hope. So I okay. was trying to seek him again, and I was uh, praying a lot to him okay. and I was you know at the point where I knew I couldn't do this alone I, I was done I, I, and the enemy had been kicking my butt for almost two decades and I knew I couldn't take him on my own okay so I was searching okay. I wasn't really succeeding but I was searching okay well sometimes that's what God wants he's looking for a heart that's searching for him exactly right yeah. so uh, okay so I start searching on the internet for this mystery man that he told me about and thank goodness for Al Gore for inventing the internet. Thank you for that so much, <laughs> uh, uh, Vice President. And uh, I'm searching and searching and searching, and I find minimally invasive arthroscopic spinal surgery with a laser and a camera. I said, this has got to be him. Now, a lot of people do that today, but this is 14 years ago. Uh, it was back uh, in the days of dial-up, right? Yeah. 300 baud modems. <laughs> exactly. It took me eight hours to find this guy. <laughs> today it takes eight seconds, but You're eight right. hours back then. So I find him. And I sent him an email, and I put everything in that God told me to say, including failure to assist me will lead to your eternal damnation. Wow. And I'll never forget, my wife was standing above my shoulder, and she says to me, you can't put that in the email. He's going to think you're crazy. I said, this is what God told me to do. i got to do it. I hit send. Mm -hmm. Two minutes later, he emails me back. He said, how did you know we were looking for a new spokesperson? What? We didn't put that job in the paper yet. There's no way you could have known. Wow. I emailed him back. I said, I told you. God told me. He said, okay, mail me down your film. Let me see the MRIs. So I sent him right over down, overnight him. Right? He's in Florida. And so uh, this is all within 24 hours. He calls me. And he says, I don't know how to tell you this, kid. He said, but I, there's nothing I can do for you. I can't fix this. I work on the disc. I shrink it with the laser. It comes off the nerve. The pain goes away. You've got this bone hanging over here. It's the worst spine I've ever seen. Mm. Nothing I can do, man. I'm sorry. And, I, you know, I appreciate the fact that you put a picture of your MRI in the back of your book, Pain Was My Friend, so you can actually see the MRI. It says, MRI of my spine, the dog leg. What yeah, is it's got, that's what it looks like, a dog leg of a golf course. That's what my spine looks like, you mm. know. Mm. It's that bad. Any layman could see that MRI and see it. Yep. That it's that bad. And so he says to me, I can't help you. And I started to cry. And then there's a couple seconds of silence, and then he says to me, but I'm not going to go against God. Mm. If God told me you're supposed to come to me, come down here. I'll figure something out. If you want to share the risk with me, I'll figure out a way to help you. But you're going to have to share the risk with me, and we'll see what happens. Okay. I said, okay. I got nothing to lose. So we get to his clinic, and he sits me down. He says, okay, I can't put the bone back. And you were right not to believe them. They would have never got it to stay. It would have popped again. I'm not going to try to do that. I'm going to shave off a little bit of the bottom. I'm going to take chisels with my little tube. I'm going to take about a third of that vertebrae that's hanging over. I'm going to suck up the little pieces of bone through my tube, and then I'm going to make a channel. And then I'll pick that nerve up, and I'll move it into the channel, and that should work. And I said, what do you mean should work? He said, I told you I never did this before. Give me a break. What do you, I don't know, we're winging it here. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> and so I said, okay. I said, well, when do you want to do it? He goes, let's go right now before we both check it out. 
right then, that right day? Right there. He says, you know, you already did your blood work. You're ready to go. Give me your hand. And he starts to walk me back to the operating room. Oh, wow. And we're walking back, and he says to me, okay, well, listen, by the way, I can't knock you unconscious for this. i got to keep you awake. I said, what happened now? He said, yeah, if I cut that nerve, you'll never walk again. You're going to tell me every time I get too close to the nerve. Mm. I said, how on earth am I going to do that? He said, well, every time you scream, I'll back up a little bit. <laughs> wow. Wow, right? He says, it's going to take four hours, too. It's going to be the worst four hours of your life. You thought you knew pain before you got here. You're about to meet pain. Oh, my gosh. Do it. I said, yeah, I still, I got no choice. God told me this is where I'm supposed to go. I'm going. And this is where I'm really leaning in on the lifelong of faith, the foundation that my parents had given me. And I'm just saying, no, 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 I'm, we're going. Let's go. Mm. And so we go in the operating room, and he starts doing it. And he's chiseling on that bone while I'm awake, Daniel. I can hear it, and I'm screaming my head off. And I'm sweating and convulsing and shaking. No anesthesia whatsoever? He Not gave me a first set. He gave me like a twilight sedation. Okay. But again, I was awake. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'm screaming and yelling and screaming and yelling. In fact, I'll tell you, I was in OR1. The guy on OR3 on the other side of the building said to me afterwards in the post op, man, you got some lungs, huh? <laughs> okay. Wow. So then uh, about two hours in, I said, I, I can't do anymore. I give up. I can't, I, I can't take anymore. I can't take any more pain. I got no more tears left. I got no more sweat left. He's working on the side of me. So he stops and comes around to the front of my face, and he starts to yell at me. And he says, you got me into this. You and your eternal damnation. I'm not getting eternally damned because you can't take it. <laughs> Only two hours. So suck it up. Let's go. <laughs> wow. I, I can't even see him. I can't even focus on his face. My eyes, I can't even get a focus. But I close my eyes real tight, and I focus behind him. And what do I see? I see Jesus. There he is, Daniel, right there in the operating room. And he's smiling at me, and he's not saying a word. He's just he's just waving me. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Mm. Come on. Mm. All right, so I get tough. I said, go ahead, man. Do whatever you want to do, man. I can take it, man. You know, I'm still crying and bawling. I'm like, go ahead, man. I can do it. So he finishes. He finishes that bone, and then he picks the nerve up and moves it into that channel, okay? You've got a, you've got a root canal. You know a nerve don't want to get touched. Oof. He's picking it up and moving it into the thing. I'm feeling that too, boy. And now it's getting underneath that channel and it's actually sending an impulse down my leg. I'm actually getting feeling in my leg again for the first time in the decade. Right there on the operating table. Mm. And I'm screaming at him, Doc, I feel it. I feel it down my leg. I feel it down my leg. He stops the surgery again. He comes around front. He says, I know that you can feel it. I'm the one doing the surgery. Could you please shut up? It's very distracting. <laughs> I'm, I'm busy now. Please stop it. Okay. Then he finishes the whole surgery and there's three other people in the room. He throws them out. He says, get out. They ran so fast. They had had enough of the blood curdling screams. Oh, my gosh. He walks to the other side of the room, and he says, you want this? You want the job now? You want to be the spokesperson? You want to travel around the country and tell your story? Okay, prove to me this works. Slide off that table and walk over here to me. Mm. I said, how could you be so cruel? You know my leg doesn't work. Why would you say that? And he said, no, I'm pretty sure it does now. Come on, walk over here. And I slid off that table, and I walked to him. Both legs working for the first mm-hmm. time almost mm-hmm. a decade. It's like a walk of faith, right? Rise up it, and walk. Take up your mat was, and it walk. It was a Lazarus moment. <laughs> I literally came in and went, okay? And he just literally just, he, it was a miracle healing right there on the spot. I walked into the post stop and everybody's cheering. All right, and they sat me down. They gave me an English muffin and some juice. And we're all sitting there talking and hanging out like nothing happened. That is amazing. And you actually, you had a vision of Jesus while in I the surgery? Him, I saw him perfectly clear. Wow. And he was just smiling, and he was just going, come on, come on. He was just taking his hand and waving it towards himself, come on. And he had these piercing eyes, these unbelievable piercing eyes. Wow. But that's all I kept seeing was his eyes. And they were really, really powerful. Mm. And he just gave me the courage I needed to finish, you know, to get through the next two hours. And then, you know, an hour after the surgery was over, he said, okay, get dressed, get out of here, we'll see you tomorrow. I said, what do you mean? You just did this to me. There's going to be like a round-the-clock vigil at my bedside. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, no, this is ambulatory surgery. I have no place for you to stay here. Get out. We'll see you tomorrow. And we went across the street to the pizza parlor and had dinner, my parents and my wife and I. That is amazing. You yeah. know what I, I love about this story is that, you know, God works in so many different ways. He can heal miraculously. He can heal through doctors. He can do a combination of both. And the fact that he led you through a dream to this doctor I think is significant. You know, if you read the Bible, you see that God spoke in dreams to many different people. Um, You know, Joseph, Mary's husband, had a dream. Um, Many of the prophets had dreams. 
And some people don't realize that God still speaks to people today through dreams. And I think it's wonderful that he led you to this doctor. And this special relationship between you and the doctor and what happened led to kind of uh, a ministry in helping other people. And it also helped you to, to really grow in your faith and your walk with the Lord. Tell us what happened after that. I wound up going to work for him for the next, I don't know, four or five, I think it was almost six years, actually, to tell you the truth. And I helped like 8,500 more people get that surgery and were able to get their lives back, too. And by retelling the story every weekend, they sent me to a different city in the country, and I would tell the story, and then they would sign up and fly down and get the surgery. And watching them get healed by my story got me to start to understand why God put me through this in the first place. Mm. And what this really meant, what the value of it all was, and that the pain had been worth it. Because look at all the other people I was able to help. That's right. So yeah, physically I got healed that first day, but then the emotional and the spiritual healing took place in the process of continually sharing that story in the goal of saving other people. Right. As I watched each of them metamorphosize in front of my eyes and see them come out of the surgery the same way. Mm Mm-hmm. I began to take it as a badge of courage. I began to take it as, wow, God, you chose me for this. That is amazing. You let this happen to me so that I could do this for these people. Wow. Thank you. I I began to thank him for it instead of curse him for it. Isn't that amazing? It really is amazing. Uh, Wow. You know, we we go through things in life. Let's face it. we, We live in a broken world. And if you've been alive for any length of time, you've probably encountered suffering in some form. And that's just a result of living in a cursed, broken world. But, you know, God can use that suffering and he can turn it around. The Bible says that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8.28. And it's obvious in your case, Pete, God allowed this pain in your life for a greater purpose. And I'm so glad and thankful that you recognize that and you were able to turn it around, you know, and use it. Use your experience to God's glory. Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and again, our special guest today is Pete O'Shea. He's the author of the book, Pain Was My Friend. He's also a radio show host himself down in Florida and a stand-up comic as well. Now, Pete, going forward, you know, how did this incident and helping all these people, how did it help you to really solidify your walk with the Lord? And then how did that lead into getting into a radio ministry? You know, it all came together. It really did. Uh, again, once I now was healed emotionally and physically, the spiritual healing was easy there afterwards, and I began to see that it was him the whole time. And I began to tell people uh, that, you know, I work for God, and that you needn't worry. We go on small planes sometimes to these, to these seminars, those little teeny ones that look like from Major League, the movie with the with the cellophane <laughs> and, and tape on the wing and all that kind of Right. <laughs> and I would say to them, don't worry, sit next to me, you're going to be fine, because God didn't put me through all this, and he's going to take me like Buddy Holly, it ain't going to happen. All right, mm. I've got much more to do, and I'm working for him. And I began to slowly get into that. And then we began uh, volunteering at, at church, and then I uh, became the youth pet minister at the church, and then I started doing more and more, and, and then uh, that led to speaking at conferences and retreats, and then that led to coming here to the radio, to WTIS, which is the inspiration station. And it's been Christian talk here down in Tampa Bay for 40 years. Mm. And so now I come full circle. I went to school for broadcasting. Right. And I thought I was going to be a basketball count, all right? And now I do a three-hour daily talk show about Jesus Christ, and people listen all over the country and all over the world because we stream it live at uh, WTIS1110.com. I'm on every afternoon, 3 to 6. And I get to do a daily talk show about Jesus and bring on these amazing, inspiring people who tell their stories or their story of redemption. And, and it's amazing that he lets me do this. Mm. And again, it's come full circle like this. I love it's it. a very much a Saul to Paul moment. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he said, well, I, you, you, you're, you're coming to work for me now. You know, I love and, it. And it was amazing. So I'm Pete. Now I, I say in the book, I'm Pete, but now I'm Cleet. I'm Cleet O'Shea is my new name. Cleet O'Shea. But, yeah, I can't be Fleet or Meat or Sleet. That ain't going to work, right? So Cleotis, if you want to call me, you know, technically. And, and, and it's a whole new life. I've been dying to self and born again to him. And I now I, I'm a Christian comedian. We do it only in churches. We raise money. We send people on mission trips. We put rules on churches by telling jokes in the altars. That is so okay, awesome. And, and I, you know, we do a three-hour daily talk show about Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Everything I do now is about him. That's because he has now shown me this incredible love and mercy. that I got the second chance that I didn't deserve. Mm. But he'd already won the victory for me. 
right? And yeah. It's so amazing. That is amazing. I love how he uh, he uses all of our gifts and talents. Um, you know, it's, it's so funny that you went to St. John's University for, for communications because I did too, and I never thought I would be on the radio, uh, you know, sharing about Jesus and stuff, but he prepares us for everything that he has for us to do in life, and it's just a wonderful thing to, to know that you're doing that. And, you know, there's one anecdote in your book that I found hilarious that I really want you to share. We've got about three minutes left, to, so... But if you can share about the time where you were yelling at God and you went out into the water oh, yeah. okay. with the Chinese lady and you know what yep. happened with that, that was really amazing and a it great really analogy. Was. I was on the radio the day before and a friend of mine called me afterwards and she said, you're not in the spirit right now. You're, you're, you're buying into the high people are telling you how good you are at this and you're in the flesh right now. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. What do I do? I'm in the spirit. No. And she called. She says, I'm going to call you fleshy until you get it, until you, you know, come around to <laughs> I was really mad at that, and I had a dream that night that Fleshy was chasing me. And it was sort of a cross between SpongeBob and Barney, and was chasing me around. I'm screaming, no, Fleshy, don't hit me, go kill me. <laughs> and so the next day, we're doing the radio shows from the beach, because I got a really tough life. And uh, between the two shows, uh, I was doing two shows back then, uh, I went and took a swim. And I was so mad still from what, it, what she had told me. And I was so mad, and I was angry at God. I'm like, you know, so I get out there in the water. I walk all the way out to about show the link, and I stood still for 20 minutes in the water. And I'm yelling at God, how did you let this happen? How did you let me become fleshy? You put me to work for you. You brought me into all this. I was happy just doing stand-up, and you made me do all this stuff. And why didn't you protect me from, from becoming fleshy? And as I'm doing that, a little Chinese lady swimming by, and she pushes me, and she goes, you know, swim here. But I was still so involved in what I was doing, I wasn't paying attention. And then uh, when I come out of the water... There was a couple sitting at the edge of the water, and they were laughing. And I said, what's so funny? They said, you don't know how close you came to dying. Mm. I said, what do you mean? She says, the whole time, I don't know what you were doing, but the fact that you didn't move around, splash or swim, is the only thing that saved your life. Because four ten-foot bull sharks were circling you the whole time. Oh, my gosh. And I said, oh, my. And I looked up at God. I said, okay, I get it. If I bring it to you, like I did out there in the water, and I stood perfectly still because I was arguing with you, You'll protect me from fleshy, from the sharks, we're fleshy. Mm. And you'll protect me. And I got down on my knees and I prayed. I said, Father, please make me the artist formerly known as fleshy. <laughs> I, I don't want to be that guy no more. I don't want to let ego and impatience and anger get in my way ever again. I love it. And that's when he brought me to that Saul Paul thing. And he said, Paul's your guy. That's, that's who the story of redemption in Scripture that's most like you is Paul. And I want you to read that. Specifically, the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9. Mm -hmm. And I want you to play all the parts. And I want you to make it a movie in your head. And when I play Ananias and I wipe the shells off Paul's eyes, in my mind, in my meditative state, I see that impatience and anger and arrogance falling off of me. And it's how I'm able to self-examine and spiritually heal and make sure that I never become fleshy again. Mm -hmm. That I know it's his radio show, it's him on those stage, that I glorify and honor him. I'm just an empty, willing vessel, and he does everything. And I got that now, thank goodness. But it took four bull sharks and a good friend to tell me <laughs> you will be in flesh. <laughs> I love it. That is so awesome. Friend, you are listening to Divine Intervention Radio. And unfortunately, we are out of time. But our special guest has been Pete O'Shea. His book is called Pain Was My Friend. Pete, thank you so much for taking the time out and sharing with Divine Intervention. I really appreciate what you're doing. And I pray that you would just keep it up. Keep doing the great work you're doing for the Lord. It's my honor and pleasure, and thank you for all you're doing for everybody. Your show lifts people up, and, and it truly is a divine intervention, and you're living your divine destiny, Daniel, so God bless you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, friend, that about does it for this episode of Divine Intervention Radio. I hope it has encouraged you to know that God is real. He is still intervening in people's lives, doing miracles, healing people, and He loves us. So take care, God bless, and God willing, we'll see you again next time for another exciting episode of Divine Intervention Radio. You've been listening to Divine Intervention with your host, Daniel Fazina. You can email Daniel at divineintervention at mail.com. That's divineintervention at mail.com. All programs of Divine Intervention are available online at divineinterventionradio.com. That's divineinterventionradio.com. Join us next time here on Divine Intervention. Ah!